collapsed in the fourth century, the, the majority of the, the, the um, barbarian kingdoms were Aryan, not Christian. So Christians worked tirelessly to convert Western Europe. But what I'm trying to point out to you is that Western civilization is bigger. As a church, as a Christian, me and my sister, right, have a joint heritage, okay? I have my heritage that's connected to Europe. My sister has a heritage that will go back to somewhere else. I don't know, Africa, yeah? We've got a heritage, but where, what, what the church does is it confederates African um, culture within the church with Christi European Christian culture within the church and brings them together in a tapestry. And yet there's still tribalism within the church. Sadly, there, there is denominationalism within the church, yes. And it's scandalous. I, I want to say that. Like, it's not something I agree with, it's something I denounce, it's something I stand against. But what I'm trying to point out to you, bro, is that you, you, have, you have no sense of yourself. Like most Europeans, you have no sense of yourself. Because the liberal progressives have robbed you of your heritage. They've robbed you of your culture. They've robbed you of your civilization. But the only way that you can reclaim it is to reclaim your Christian heritage. But there's still this fundamental question that we have with regards to... There's just a contradiction there in, in the idea that before Christ, there was no Christianity. Yeah. And so to some degree, there was a redefinition. Well, let's even say, let's even call it at the level of reality, there was a redefinition. Yes, that, uh, that, that's a really good way to put it. Then why do you not agree that the progressive liberal narrative that started with the Enlightenment did exactly the same thing? So, no, I'm, I'm not saying it didn't. The, the, the liberal Enlightenment is an attempt to redefine to redefine um, Western civilization. So then why do, you, why do you think these two events differ in their fundamental characteristics? Because, so, so one is the cosmological significance. Firstly, when, when Christ becomes incarnate, he redefines what it is to be human. Okay. And, but the thing is, he, he, isn't, he isn't something that just materializes out of history, out of nowhere. It's Christ, the Christ event is rooted in Judaism. There is prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, over 300 prophecies that were hundreds of years before Jesus that all point to Jesus, that point to his life, the circumstances of his birth, the kind of life that he would live, the way that he would die. And they were written hundreds of years before he was born. And Christ fulfills them right down to how he enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey and acclaimed by the people. He fulfills them. So hold on, if we go, if we go into that for a second. So, bear in mind I'm not necessarily a progressive, but I am trying to understand what you're saying in terms of things. <laughs> it seems again in the same way that the appearance of Christ redefined things because it fulfilled prophecies. The meta-narrative of the liberal progressive is now being vindicated and validated to such a degree in the West, and I'm just not able to see, therefore, okay. the fundamental difference between the two. I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to you're trying to mythologize Christ. Christ was a real person in history, who did real things. He lived a real life. He was born of a real virgin. He died a real death by crucifixion. What's your opinion on Nietzsche, for instance? Well, we'll come to Nietzsche. Okay. But the point is that that person in history is the touchstone upon which everything else is built. The enlightenment, actually, it says in scripture that wisdom is known by her children. The enlightenment is leading to the death of Western civilization. Western civilization is dying because it's spiritually starved. It obsesses about the material, about the scientific, about what we can do because we have the technology to do it. And Western people have stopped feeding their souls so much that they look up to um, um, the, the, the people that appear. What's that program, Essex, about Essex? Those people from Essex. Oh, um, Only Way is Essex. Only that they look up to those, I'm glad I don't know the name of that program. Yeah. They, they, they look up to, they look up to the, sorry for the slap down. Sorry for the slap down, <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the point is that in the West, we, we glorify these celebrities. 
rather than glorify people who have achieved great things like St. Francis of Assisi I'll never, or St. Augustine. I'll never deny the, uh, the sacrifice of the saints, for sure. Uh, yeah. So now you came to Nietzsche. Yeah. It's a great question. I've lectured on Nietzsche. Okay. okay? Um, I've been barred from universities for talking about Nietzsche. Okay. But, but Nietzsche basically, he understood the full cataclysm of what it meant to say that God is dead. He didn't say that in celebration. He said that in, in tragedy. He said that in mourning. He said that in despair. God is dead. Now, up has become down. Black has become white. Everything has disappeared. We neither know whether we're rising or falling. I'm not quoting Nietzsche ad verbatim, but I'm, I'm giving a paraphrase of something that he said. The, 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 death, of, the death of God was, was something that Nietzsche said would lead to the last man. And the last man, he said, was the kind of man that would look up at the wonder of the stars and simply blink. Meaning that the last man would be so dearth within his soul, so empty, so vacuous of all meaning, that he would see the wonders of the cosmos and not be moved by it. And Nietzsche said that the only way that we could overcome this abyss that we are going to fall into is by the rising of the Übermensch. And the Übermensch is the great man that constructs his own meaning. He is the champion, the hero that triumphs over the meaningless of the cosmos by building his own meaning. But here's the problem. How is that in line with the church? Here's the problem. Is that when we look around for the Übermensch, when we look around for that Superman, who are the only candidates? The only candidates that stand tall over civilizations are religious figures. Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, when we look at those figures, who is the champion that stands tallest over all of those? Buddhism is a, a religion that fundamentally, even the Buddhists admit, that their texts don't go back to the Buddha. That, 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 that I've been to Japan. I don't know if you've ever been to a Buddhist country. No. Like, but, but a million and one sects of Buddhism argue over what the Buddha's teachings are. A million sects over Christianity don't argue over what Jesus' teachings are. They argue about how to construct the church in his name. Islam asks you to follow a paedophile rapist who allowed his followers to rape and pillage and rob. Islam is a religion that when it is implemented would treat me as a second class citizen just because I'm a Christian. Would treat a Jew as a second class citizen just because they're a Jew. And if hypothetically, God forbid this sister ever was ever a Muslim, would treat her as a second class citizen because she's a woman and would kill you outright because you're none of the above. But there's still, to me, there's still this kind of, I don't know if metaphysical is the right word, but there's basically this leap, I don't want to get too complicated, there's basically the, this seeming leap of faith from, I guess, where my position is, to jump to and accept wholly the principles, I suppose, that guided the, the prophecies of Judaism that you have to enter into before you become a Christian and accept that Christ was the Messiah. Does that make sense? What do, what do you mean by the prophecies of Judaism? The prophecies. The prophecies of Judaism. Well, I mean, the prophecies of Judaism are, are, are simply a test. You look at the prophecies, then you look at the life of Jesus. I mean, we could do one right now if you wanted. Sure. Yeah, okay. So, let's get out. My, my point to you is that if these prophecies are true, then you have a you have a evidence to the truth of the Christian faith. But I just want to finish my thought on my last point. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus Christ calls us to live the kind of life that that establishes the full beauty of the human soul. He calls us to live a life that is based upon love, truth, hope. He calls us to live by faith. When we live by these axioms, it, it, it draws out of the human being all that is best about his nature, all that is the image of God within his nature is drawn out when we live by these axioms. So we live the best kind of life. So Nietzsche was looking for an Übermensch. 
And I'm saying to you that the, the, the Ubermensch that Jesus, that, that Nietzsche was looking for was Jesus Christ. Then why did he not find it in Jesus Christ? And because all he, could, all he could see, all he could see was the weakness of the church. That's all he could see. He was disgusted, as I am disgusted, by the cultural civility and passionless and empty vacuous ritual of, of Christendom. That's what he was horrified by. He was not, he was not horrified, he was not horrified by Jesus Christ. I don't believe he ever really considered Jesus Christ. But we, let's come to one of these prophecies, okay? In Isaiah 53, okay, we have a description of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So it's quite a long passage, yeah? So. Stop me as we need to, and, and, and I'll interject as I need to. So in Isaiah 53, now, do you know when Isaiah 53 was written? Uh, no. It was written, it was written approximately, if I'm, I get my memory correct, 600 years before Jesus' birth. Okay. This is what it says. Who has believed our message? Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him, like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one with whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Now let's just pause a minute. When you look, bear in mind that this was written 600 years before Jesus Christ. When you look at the portraits that are portrayed in the four gospels of Jesus, we see a man, a rabbi, who said that he didn't have a, a, a roof to shelter under, that he slept with the foxes and the birds in the, in the holes in the ground. He was someone who was often chased out of areas, he was beaten, yeah, people wanted to stone him. He had followers. He was someone who performed miracles, but then people would follow him, not because they wanted to follow his teaching, but just because they wanted bread to eat. People looked at Christ in the wrong way. There was nothing about him that attracted us to him. He, did, he wasn't born to a royal family. He wasn't born to a regalious standing. He wasn't born in a palace. He was a peasant rabbi preacher. Okay, so hold on. So first, this kind of goes into the inequities of man then, because I suppose, why is it then that the Catholic Church holds to such a high standard the way it builds its churches, for instance, or its cathedrals, whereas the Protestants from Protestant churches I've seen don't? Because if, if Christ rejects all these notions of, shall we say, grandiosity, then why is it the churches are built, like the Hagia Sophia, for instance, to reflect grandiosity over in celebration? Okay, so I, 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 I want to, because I don't think you're tracking with what I'm saying about the prophecies. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to address your question, but I, I want to finish what I'm talking about in terms of the prophecies. So we've got a man um, who, who lived, who had this life that had, had nothing to draw people to him, and very often people were drawn to him for the wrong reasons, okay? He had times when his followers just left him, when he preached something that was too hard for them to, to swallow. And then, at the end of his life, he was scourged and whipped and beaten by, because of false accusations that were made against him, and he was crucified on a tree. Now, in Jewish custom, in Jewish law, th their understanding was that if you were hung on a tree, you were accursed of God. Now, bearing in mind, what did the prophecy say? It said 
that he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Um, let's say... Uh, oh, no. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So Christ was crucified and the Jewish people saw that as, well, God has cursed you. Right. Okay. But yet, at that moment, because remember, we started this conversation talking about historicities, the historicity of Herodotus and Christian historicity, the idea of salvific history. Which I, 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 I argue to you, the only way that we can truly understand our world is with the help of Revelation. We've got a reason from Revelation, if you remember me saying that. Yeah? yeah? Not, not, we can't just construct it ourselves because we're incapable of seeing the world for what it truly is. So Christ, at that moment when he was being crucified, God was fulfilling all of the prophecies that he had planted in the, the corporate memory of Israel was being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He was, he was redeeming the world. He was opening up the opportunity that some lost poor sheep like you who has gone astray, because what does it say in scripture? It says, um, but he was pierced, the chastening of our well-being, for your scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That a lost sheep like you can find the shepherd, the Ubermensch, the one that Nietzsche was desperately searching for, but couldn't find in the church. Now, you asked a question, yeah, let, I, I, I haven't no, forgotten sorry, the question. Can we park my earlier question for a moment? Yeah. Because we're still tracking on prophecy. Um, last passage you just read, geez, sorry, my memory's terrible. The last passage you just read, um, why, why is it then that there were lost sheep in your mind at the stage, at that stage in humanity? Yeah, there's, there's lost sheep in every age of humanity. Okay. That this is the true salvific, that the salvific reading of history is the only way to read history. Because the, the point of a human being is that we, our telos, is, is to be pointed towards God. The purpose of our lives is to be pointed towards God. And the thing is, because of the sinful nature, because of our entrapment to the flesh and the desires of the flesh, and because of our barrage of, of, of being soaked in the, the world and all of its ways, we lose sight that beyond the, 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 the great hymn of, of all of creation is hymning to the fact that beneath it all there is this great grounding of truth that is the Creator. And if there is a Creator, we should direct our lives towards Him. And if you accept that we should direct our lives towards him, then we need to find his light. We need to find that point of reference by which we can coordinate ourselves in his direction. So the lost sheep is in every age, but Jesus is that light. He is the one that we can, we can find truth in, that we can find God through. Yeah, I think at that point we can come back to the question of why is it necessary, I suppose, to preserve the image of Christ, shall we say, the humblest amongst the humble, through the most grandiose structures, statues, churches, um, even, even the early monks that you talked about, they meticulously painted in calligraphy and, I would assume, in Latin, everything to preserve well, the tale of Christ, among other th other artifacts in Western civilization. So, uh, again, I would I would point out that Christian Christianity in the church is bigger than than Western civilization. So, okay, when you sure. say monks meticulously copied in Latin, well, that's true in the West, but it's not true in the East. They did it in Greek. It's not true in Egypt. They did it in Coptic. It's not true in Ethiopia. They did it in Ethiopic. And it's not true in Syria. They did it in Syriac, Aramaic. It's not true in in, in Slavonic lands where they did it in Slavonic. So what I'm saying is, never ever associate, never think, when, when, when someone becomes a Christian, they enter into a bigger paradigm than Western civilization. That's what I'm inviting you to. I'm inviting you to, at one and the same time, claim your heritage as a Western European, but embrace a heritage that is global. 
And that's what every Ethiopian does. They claim their heritage is an Ethiopian, but they claim a heritage that is global. You know, and 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 the, the, but in in terms of why do we do grandiose buildings? It's a, it's a very simple thing. We as Christians, we believe that we are to give our best to God in everything. So we always give our best to God. That that is. So I give my best effort in 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 trying to speak to people about my faith. Yeah. Sometimes I fail. Um, a scientist gives his best effort in how he does science. To the glory of God. An architect does his best effort in how he designs a building. Uh, a stonemason does his best effort. A community does their best effort. So these cathedrals, these these churches of great beauty that are your heritage, you know, they're your heritage. That great, the Notre Dame Cathedral of, of, of Paris, you know, the, the one w w that was burnt down. That's your heritage as a Western European. St. Paul's Cathedral is your heritage. But you have no sense that it's yours because it's, you've been brainwashed by liberal progressives. And I'm inviting you to chuck away the liberal progressive brainwashing and embrace a Christian identity. Now, we, our, our ancestors did their best effort to build these houses of worship that they would worship in. Yeah? Bear in mind, these churches were built to house hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people. It, it's the collective effort, basically, of entire generations of people. They're still building the Sagrada de Familia in Barcelona. They're building it by people that go and visit it. Every, every 12 euros is a brick. So you pay 12 euros or 20 euros to get in or whatever it is, and that pays for one brick. So, so, so the point is, it's a collective effort. And what's wrong with people glorifying the ultimate truth with their best efforts. Why does it need to be material? Well, they do, it doesn't. It's not. It's not just material. The, 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 the greatest glory of God is a beautiful soul. That, that's the glory of God, is a beautiful soul. Then why does it keep coming back to they still build these grandiose structures? Out because a beautiful soul, a beautiful soul is diligent. A beautiful soul is precise, a beautiful soul is disciplined, a beautiful soul is elegant, a beautiful soul is sophisticated, a beautiful soul is cultured, and a beautiful soul will express all of those things in everything that it does. So when it comes to building buildings, it's expressed in that. But it's also expressed in the artwork. It's also expressed in the politics. There is a reason why the, the kind of, um, the, the, the values of, of the, the values of the restriction on the kings, for instance, that happened in the Magna Carta, yeah, that was negotiated between the lords, the king, via the church. There's a reason why kings had their powers restricted in Christian politics, because there was a separation of powers between the church and the state, and the church limited the powers of the state. And that goes right back to classical times when, I forget which church father it was, excommunicated a Roman emperor for killing an entire city. And he excommunicated him. It, what, Saint sorry? Ambrose, I, think I think it was, yeah, St. Ambrose. Yeah, 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 I think you're right. Yeah. St. Ambrose excommunicated the emperor of Rome because he killed an entire city. And he said, until you do penance for your sin, you can't receive the communion. Your soul is in danger. So Christians limited the power of the state long before modern democracies. The Islam, by example, Islam by contrast, has the caliph as all but all powerful. He's a tyrant. He's a dictator. So, so the thing is, bro. What I'm saying to you is that a beautiful soul expresses itself beautifully, and that means that however we do that, whether it's in our politics, in our charities, in our artwork, in our science, in our philosophy in our literature or in the way we build a building, the Christian, one of the, the traits of being a Christian is the esteeming of beauty and the cultivation of beauty. Now what's wrong with that? You know, what it seems to me is you're, you're borrowing from this classical critique, Marxist critique of, well, if, if you Christians really care about the poor, why is it you build these cathedrals with gold? It's utter rubbish. We Christians do more to help the poor than any other group. No, no way. The communists, no way. the communists have, have brought people into poverty through their ideology. 
Yeah. So we Christians have a long heritage of helping the poor. We got nothing. I'm not embarrassed at all by our cathedrals because we do more to help the poor than anyone else. The Catholic Church alone is the single largest charity working amongst the poor as a single group, as a single institution. And that's just a fact. It's an uncomfortable fact for you, but it's a fact. Name me an organization that does more. Name me an organization that's bigger. Okay, fair enough. Bro, you've been, it's been really lovely speaking with you. I want to encourage you with something, right? This, I'm going to give you a gift. Have you got a New Testament? Um, is that in the um, King James translation? No, no, I'm not, no, it's not in the King James translation. Have you got a New Testament? No. Right. That is a New Testament. Right? This book, is, that, this book, this book is part of your heritage. This book is part of your culture. This book has been the source and the inspiration of what it has meant to be European for over a thousand years. And liberal progressives have stolen that from you. Reclaim it. Reclaim it with gusto, reclaim it with pride, and look into who the person of Jesus is. Because he is the Ubermensch that Nietzsche was looking for. He was the answer to Nietzsche's riddle. And, that, and that's, that's who you need to follow. And I hope one day you'll come back to me and you'll say, I've started on my journey to being a Christian. I've started being a disciple of, of Jesus Christ. All right, enjoy your cup of tea. Enjoy your book. Yep, take care. God bless.